Right, and you can start. Uh, hello, everybody. This is uh, another uh, part of our lovely Prague uh, seminar for mathematical physics. And uh, now I would like uh, to welcome uh, Renan Lubinsky Jusinskas for, for, from uh, SFU in Prague, uh, who, uh, who, who brought a very interesting topic for us. And uh, it's called uh, Higher Spin from a Worship Perspective. So we are very looking forward to what he's going to say. So first of all, I have given this talk uh, about two weeks ago, but to a much wider audience and much more well, with much more variety. But there's not too much math, there's nothing very technical. So hopefully you'll be able to follow, but if you ask follow -up questions, I don't think I'll be able to, to give you many details. Yeah. Uh, as I said, so it's a much uh, much bigger audience, so there were a lot of questions, and it lasted for one hour. So if you don't help me, it will be crap. <laughs> okay, so this is based on a work that I did uh, uh, last year. I, I, I forgot the number, but uh, it's uh, the name of the of the paper is asymmetrically twisted string. Yeah. And the motivation, I'll give you some details, but it's basically a worksheet model where you can have a finite spectrum with higher speeds. Uh, I'll, have, I'll give you some general introduction about ambitious strings and twisted strings. So if you want the details, you can just ask me and I'll write them back. Okay, so motivation is set higher speeds, but that's not completely true because I'll say the motivation here is to understand the, the role of math in string theory. Yeah? And you probably have heard that if you study string theory, you go to the physical spectrum and there's a infinite, infinite number of states. Yeah? The higher masses, higher spins. Uh, while this is a very good uh, thing from the from the formal point of view, like these these extra features help you to 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 get unitarity of the string amplitude. Uh, you will be finite minutes, but well, a lot of a nice, uh, nice profit, like most very nice. Uh, it's rather inconvenient if you want to approach it from a field theory perspective, because if you want to have a, a field theory, you have to have a finite spectrum, so you have more control over the interactions and what's propagating there and so on. And from the sense, string theory is not uh, uh, friendly. And there were these, uh, these, these two, two works that appeared in 2013. Uh, so there, one is then one of them is the amplitude string. I'll give you more details, but basically there you have a string theory with only massless spectrum. Okay? So there will be, there'll be a graviton there and gloom and so on. And then there was this work that in fact appeared before amplitude strings uh, by uh, Zuiva, Holm, and uh, Siegel. Okay? Where they had a, like again a, a, a kind of a kind of uh, action in two dimensions, where they had a finite spectrum yeah? that included the massive spectrum plus one massive state. So you see, in this these two theories, you have a finite uh, spectrum, massless and maybe one massive level. Yeah? While in string theory, you have infinite many levels. And uh, another interesting uh, uh, property of these higher levels is that they come with higher spins. So basically, if you have, uh, let's say, a uh, mass level n in string theory, the spin that will come at that uh, level is this one, n plus one. So if you go to higher levels, you automatically get higher spins. Not all the states of this level are higher spins, but uh, you get there. For example, for n equals two in the bosonic string, you get a state with spin three and a state with spin one. And so already there you see this spin three, which is considered higher speed. So the, like the, the the motivation of my work was to okay, what's uh, what's special about these models? Why why are they sending out only one massive level? Can I go higher, but it's at the same time keep the the finiteness of the spectrum? And uh, the point is that at the end, the, if we can isolate these mass levels, we will have a more controlled, let's say, future, future controlled uh, environment for studying mass in string theory. Okay. 
Okay, I already mentioned something like this. So, it's team theory. Uh, people say it's a theory of everything, and that includes higher things, higher masses, and whatever you you want there. But in a way, it's plagued by this infinite number. And what we know uh, a lot in string theory is about the mesh spectrum. We know all these uh, techniques to compute scattering amplitudes, uh, double copy, and so on. They come basically from the, the mesh spectrum string theory. Okay? There is this uh, KLT relation, I'll, I'll, mention, uh, I'll mention a bit about it later. But the point is that if, from a string theory perspective, you want to include higher spins, you encounter a lot of problems. It's very hard to include, for example, only one higher spin. You see that if you if you want to impose some kind of uh, consistency conditions of this field theory, you see that you will have to add another higher spin and then another higher spin, and at the end you recover the, the whole spectrum string theory. So there is this paper here from 2016. I think the number is the name is uh, sorry. Everyone. I think the asymptotic finite, uh, asymptotic uniqueness of the Venezian amplitude. Yeah? Venezian amplitude is the amplitude you get from string theory. And it said that if you want to add higher spins, you have to add a lot of them. And then at the end, you're just basically getting the, the Venezian amplitude from string theory. Yeah? So the point here is like, okay, what does it mean to be consistent? Or what are the consistency criteria that they have here to impose that, uh, that I'll get to the, the string theory amplitude? Okay. So as I said, higher spins they come naturally from the from the higher. Right? Yeah, so uh, higher spins they come naturally from higher levels. But from a more uh, pragmatic perspective, are there higher spins in nature? Huh? So for example, you can you can look at black holes. Black holes are spinning objects, and in certain approximations, you can uh, you can describe them as uh, like a, a massive uh, higher spin particle. But you can see a lot of composite states, like these blue balls in particles, you know, the gluons are self interacting, so they have these bound states of, of gluons. Uh, hadrons, in general, they're, they're composite particles with higher spins, so you can have hadrons of spin three halves, two, four, five halves, and so on. And uh, all these things, they seem to be composite objects, right? But from a few tier perspective, we can try to describe them effectively as a fundamental quantity. And even uh, in dark matter. So there are dark matter uh, models for higher spins. Yeah. Uh, but then, uh, except for these models, which are phenomenological, all of these uh, kind of higher spin excitations are, are not fundamental. But this is in general not a problem, because we can learn a lot from effective field theories. And that's what we are, in fact, after, right? We, we want to, to describe nature in, in different regimes. And then for, for this purpose, having the effective few, few theories, even if they're not completely unitary and so on, it's, it's a good thing. So, OK. So again, higher spins in string theory, they appear as a, as a bunch of particles. But can we learn anything from them? They're all there. And in fact, we, we can, uh, because string theory will, will describe these higher things. The question is how to extract them. And that's the, that's the, the point here. But effectively, it's very hard to, to get information of higher things from, from string theory. And again, this problem is, is, is related to the infiniteness of the physical spectrum. Okay? And this is manifested in, in different uh, different ways. So let me try to motivate a bit, like how does this uh, infinite spectrum appear in string theory? So you're probably tired of, of hearing that uh, there are closed strings and open strings, and they have vibration modes, and these vibration modes will give you different masses, different spins, and this is basically how, how it comes about. And, and if, you, if you want a more fundamental perspective, at the end of the day, this is the kind of equation that uh, you're going to, to try to solve for, for the, the word sheet, for the, the equation motion for the string. So it's a wave equation. Yeah. So 
you see there are oscillations there depending on the boundary conditions. If you have a open or closed strings, you have different vibration modes. And these modes appear, uh, appear in the, in the Fourier study. Yeah, so, for example, this is something that you're going to see there. E to the I is the signal. And then also the conjugate part and so on. So these are the modes that uh, you see there. And this is basically how we build the, let's say, the, the spectrum of the string. For example, there are these minus one modes acting on some ground state. You see, this is a vector. This is a space-time vector. So this would be described uh, describing the photon or the gluon. If you want to go to higher mass levels, for example, you can have uh, this kind of thing, alpha n, alpha n, minus one, minus one, like on least. And you see the same level, level two, you have this other particle here. Yeah. So each one of these vibration modes in the, in the quantum theory, you can convert as a creation operator that will give you all these uh, 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 excited states. Yeah? So this is going to be like massless, this is mass level one, and then you can just move on. It's, it's very intuitive. But uh, from a theory perspective, how, to, how do you see these extra, extra modes? So if you basically, if you compute any four-point amplitude in string theory, there will be this channel here. And this channel, this channel will contain all the spins that you have in the spectrum. There is no way to get rid of them. And these are kind of virtual particles. You know, like, just like you see in, in quantum field theory, and there is no way of getting it of them. Yeah? So each one of these vertices here will have whatever you want here, like external X, for example, we can have a graphic from here or, or a blue, but here at the, at the internal lines, we have all the spins. Yeah? So this is the problem why, why you cannot really decouple all these spins from, from string theory, because no matter what you put here on the side, if you even if you restrict the external X, the entire ones will have all the higher spins. And of course, these have a, a non trivial contribution to the amplitude. Right? So it's it's very hard to isolate them. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Hmm? Uh, the formula S equals uh, n plus one. Uh -huh. uh, is this true only for higher vibrational mode, like higher than the first? or? Uh, like, so this, this, is the the this is what we call uh, the, the highest ratio trajectory. Ah, okay. So, is so this is the highest thing you get for a given level. But that, that is, is this true? Like, let us the blue one. Blue ah. as as uh, n equals. Uh, are you thinking? Are you yeah, depending on if you go to the bosonic string or, or the super string. The bosonic string, there is a, the tactile level. So it will be n equals 1, if you want, or n equals 0, depending on. But uh, in the in the super string, the gluon would be n equals zero. Ah, okay. Yeah, because this is the ground state. Okay, so this, this, this I should consider this for a, for a super string. Yeah, if you want for for bosonic string, you just remove the one. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I hope I hope it's clear that even if you don't have higher spins in the uh, out, uh, external states, the internal states will have it. Yeah? So you have to take them into account. And how do you see this from, from string theory, from, from like actual computation of the amplitudes? And this is what you see here. So these are very famous results. So I, I, I believe you have heard of the Veneziano amplitude. This is, this is one for open strings. And then there is a closed string version from Gilles Robichaud here. So what are these equations telling? So these are gamma functions. S are just kinematic variables, so let me write here. You know, what you see that S and U are just given in terms of the moment of the external particles. Yeah. So that when you pay one P2 square, this is what we have there S, then the same for T. A1 plus Q3 and U A1 plus K. And there, there's some normalization here that depends on the string coupling, but this is basically what you see there. And what are these uh, amplitudes telling me? 
What happens, for example, when uh, for s is equal to to one? I have gamma zero there. Yeah? For s equals two, I have uh, sorry. For s equals uh, minus one, I would not say I have gamma of minus two. Yeah? Gamma of minus two, as you know, is, is divergent. So this is how you identify the pole. So in this picture here, all these exchanges, some of them will will let's say fall on shell, and this uh, on shell condition will basically be the mass of the states that are appearing here. Okay? And you see here for any 4s uh, negative integer, there will be poles there. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is how you identify, that's how you know that uh, there are at least uh, higher modes uh, propagating there. The same for T here, and then you have a cyclic operation. So you okay. have mm -hmm. assuming complex uh, K1, complex momenta, no? You're saying that well, it becomes uh, negative. Huh? No, but I think there is a signature. Yeah? Usually, ah, uh, right. uh, sure. there's a signature there. So we usually use minus plus plus. Right. Yeah? Or, but the uh, S negative means that positive much square. Yeah? Oh, it's written there. I <laughs> so I have you asked you and you. This, this is the, the thing. Uh, String length of a prime, and see for for the closed string, the, the structure is mostly the same. We have the poles here for negative s, negative integers, and the new. So this is like more pragmatic. How do you see all these states propagating there? You just look at the poles of the four point amplitudes. Okay, then. To come back to the question that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, are there strings with finite spectrum? And, and there are. So one of them uh, is this ambitious string. It was discovered in 2013. And it came back with this uh, so-called CHY amplitude. So CHY amplitudes are a way to describe scattering amplitudes using some uh, integration over a Riemann sphere. So you can map any scattering amplitude uh, mass as you want in terms of an uh, integration over a Riemann sphere. And this is a very close connection to string theory, right? And uh, this one, ambitious string in particular, is a chiral string in a way that the, the worksheet action, for example, is very simple. I think uh, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll see it in the next slide, probably. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. But the point is that uh, this ambitious string, it automatically includes this constraint here, this square equals zero. Yeah. So this is a massless constraint. And when you do that, you see that uh, in your spectrum you have only masses and up, only up to spin two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There could be some higher derivative uh, fields there also, but uh, the spin doesn't go beyond two. Then can we put uh, message states there? And then it turns out that in the same year, in fact, earlier, slightly earlier than the two strings, there was this model proposed by, by the home Siegel and uh, Zipper, where they had a uh, fine spectrum, massive spectrum, and only one massive level. And curiously, this massive level it coincides with the first massive level of the open chain. And then it goes, okay, what's special about the first? Like, can I go higher? And this is related to, 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 to the higher spin that I'm going to discuss. Okay. And then uh, two years later, Seagull just, just showed that, in fact, ambitious strings are kind of a tensionless limit of this HSD model. So this, what you see, ambitious string here is just a, a tension with limit of, of, the, of the model. And all these massive modes, what, what happens, they have some mechanism there, and they, they help to implement these higher layers. But so then the point is that uh, even here in the massive, uh, the massive case, you can take it and connect to ambitious So this you can kind of consider as a, a unified model. And there are different ways of seeing this. Uh, so here on the left hand side you have the ambitious string, and then on the right hand side the chiral string or the HSC model. You see that the action is very simple. This is a two-dimensional action. This X is the, the target space coordinate, so this is the coordinate of the of the of the string in space time. And these here are goals. They come from the reparameterization symmetry and from this constraint constraint here that I showed you, this square code zero. Uh, so what was the P then? What's that? The, the, the PN? P? Yes. Uh, it's just the conjugate of X. Uh, okay, something Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is the first order action. So it's like 
almost in the Hamiltonian form. Yes. Okay. Uh, so notice that this actually doesn't have any dimension for parameter, particularly the, the length of the string that, uh, that I showed earlier. It appears in the amplitude here. It, it doesn't show there. This VNCR are somehow inter, in, uh, interested for the strength? Or they are. Or they are the target, target also? Or? No, they're, they're not in their code. So this BC comes from reparentization symmetry. So gauge fixing and B bar C bar are the from the this whole thing, this very good. And so these are the ghosts. Uh -huh. okay. So there are two constraints, as I said. So if you can look at the BRC chart here. So T is the energy momentum tensor, so it comes from the reparameterization symmetry, and H is the P square equals zero constraint. So each one of them is accompanied by the ghost, and there are some other pieces here that depend on the ghost. Right? The only difference between amplitude and the kind of string are the constraints. Okay? So here you see there's a there's a deformation with a dimension full parameter. And this dimension full parameter is exactly the one that you that you need to get uh masses there. Huh? I have a question. So you have a B and C and B hat and C hat. So this is the the, the, the two parameters and the two string or so these are related to the different constraints. You, you you shouldn't think of them as coming from the right moving sector of the string. Yeah, so there is no T bar there in a way. There's only half yes. of the yeah. Yeah. So this B bar and B hat and C hat, they're in fact coming from this other constraint, B square equal to. Okay, okay, yes. And in both cases we have the bar, I see. Yeah. Yes, yeah. everything's all marked there, see? Yeah. Like uh, D bar and he likes everything. Okay. And you see here that this is kind of a, a very simple explanation of why this one is a limit of this one. Yeah? You just take off a prime going to infinity, you get the other constraint. And this works nicely at the level of the spectrum of the amplitude. You can have this mapping very, very much under control. Okay. So what does this alpha prime mean in terms of the spectrum? And so P square equals U is just the, the, the physical state conditions you get from the BRC charge. It's just basically implying the masses from B. And then in the kind of in the kind of string you have this extra freedom because the constraint is not really P square equals zero, but it's P square equals to something else. And this something else can can help you to to define uh, massive states. And then when you analyze the spectrum of this theory here. The Cairo string or the twisted string or HSC model, depending on how you want to call it, you see that uh, the spectrum is, is very nicely described by this massless one. This only this basically corresponds to to the massless spectrum of the closed string. So there's a graviton, a dilaton, and a Calvi Ramon form. But then there's this extra uh, set of states here, which is massive. Yeah? And this mass square here is precisely given in terms of this alpha prime or the inverse of alpha prime. But in any case, you see here that there's only spin two. So there's spin two and this is spin two because it's symmetric and justice. But um, uh, maybe more interesting is the fact that this, this the massive level here corresponds to, to this, as I said, to the, to the first massive level of the open string. Yeah? So now you're mixing the closed strict spectrum, massive as well, with one massive level of the open string. You see here, there's a type you now. So m squared would be positive and negative. And this is because of, of one extra thing of the bosonic case, but uh, you don't have to worry much about it now. So the tension is here, which is of a to infinity. You just get straightforward into the ambitious string. And these extra massive fields, when you look at the action, they basically become auxiliary fields to implement higher derivatives here. So, in the tension of the limit, you get higher derivative, higher derivative is gravity. Yeah. But it's very nice because you have a finite spectrum now. So you can describe all these things in terms of a Lagrangian. There is a there are goals and diagrams, but it doesn't matter because the string theory of the tools that you have with that spectrum, they will match this finite Lagrangian. Yeah. So you really have a, a string string theory with a finite spectrum that you can map directly to, to Lagrangian. And why is this interesting? It's interesting because, as I said, it describes the first mass level of the open string. 
Okay, is there any hope to like to go to higher levels and have a few theory description of higher springs? And that's that's what the, this uh, uh, ATS string is doing. Now it's done. So as I said, so why is it special? Like the first massive level, why, why cannot go higher? And it turns out that there's a very uh, let's see what we get here. Okay, before that. <laughs> Uh, this first massive level, you can map to, to a string theory, and it's a, it's a very it's a very kind of uh, intuitive, let's say, deformation, but it's also very uh, uh, heretic. <laughs> if uh, like people who want to think theory, if they see that, they say this is just nonsense, stop doing it, but uh, there are very interesting consequences. So, I don't know, if you, if you look at the and the string theory you have uh, the, the target space coordinates. There are there are there are a few these are worksheets in the dimension field, and they satisfy this of here. Okay, there's there's some function that depends on the string length. So it kind of decouples the, the allomorphic and the anti-allomorphic sector. And you see that because they appear with the same uh, coefficient here, this is basically uh, minus alpha prime over two, ln of z uh, minus y t bar. So there is no uh, branch cuts, for example, in this LP. But look at the, at the twisted space. So this chiral string here, it can be, in fact, described in terms of a, a second order uh, string, but with this uh, change in the OP. Yeah. So instead of having minus minus, you have minus and plus. When you do that, you truncate the spectrum. But then, of course, you cannot uh, write it like this. So this one is not going to Yeah. Okay. How can I see this from the string theory point of view, like from the amplitude? What does it mean to, to, to change this uh, designer? And what does it have to do with higher spins? Is this sign changed by hand or does it derive from the, from the actions or, or from the path integral somehow? Okay, so you, know, you, can, you can change it by hand, but in particular, the, the Cairo string can be thought of as a singular gauge choice of the, of the usual string. You start with the Polyakov action into the gauge fixing, but you choose a singular gauge. It's a, I shouldn't call it a gauge because the singular is not invertible, but uh, there's a choice you can make to get to this uh, sort of thing. But uh, so it's not physical because it's a singular gauge. And so you shouldn't expect, for example, uh, uh, modular invariance, something that you see in string theory happening in this, in this model because you're, you're making a very drastic change here. Right? In this. But you can derive it. That's what you're asking. Let's see. Okay, this this one uh, I mentioned here is Kopernikian factors. So basically, if you have uh, this is a, this is like slightly more technical, but I think it's very good. In the usual string, you have these uh, these two coefficients here, and then when you compute the scattering amplitudes at uh, at the end. What you're what you're effectively computing as a as a correlator in your in your worksheet is like a product of uh, of eigenmomentum states. Yeah. So that's what you're what you're doing this thing. Yeah. Effectively. And because of these OPs, you can just basically write. Because of this one, you can write this this correlator as a product of this graph. I let in j, z i j. Uh, let me call here s i j. S i j is just k i plus k j squared. Yeah? So you have here this nice uh, nice form, and again you see there is no branch cut here because you, you can always have z and z bar. Multiply it. When you do this, this choice here, so let me call this one minus minus. If you go to the minus plus version, what you get is something like this. Okay. 
z i j over z bar i j to the next entity. And so you see, here you have branch cuts because s i j is not an integer, it's a, it's a continuum variable. So this is kind of one of the drastic changes that happen when you when you just keep inside of one of them. So can send the, the same question as before. Why is why is the first message I'm special? Can I go to higher mass levels? Like what, what kind of change can I do? And this is this is a joke I made because I was giving a talk to a very string theory oriented uh, audience. And this is as I said, it's very heretic to to, to to measure these things. But there is the same in Brazil, like since, since in hell, let's have the devil, and then we propose this other change, which is going a bit further. Okay? So instead of having just plus there, let's put a parameter here, an integer. Okay? And it turns out that this n here is precisely the, the mass level that uh, I was talking to you before. Okay? okay, so this is the only thing that I'm going to do. So instead of clicking the sign, I'll flip the sign and add an integer parameter there. And so it's very simple multiplication. Okay, so what's the implication of this physical spectrum? How can I see that I am getting higher mass levels? And it's basically this construction here. So you, you don't have to, to, to worry too much about the form of this vertex operator, but this is a, an operator that describes the physical states in the stream. So if I want to have them in the, in the, in the cohomology, the BRC cohomology, I just um, basically annihilate them with the BRC charge. And at the end, I get this, this condition here. Yeah? So what does it mean here? Minus one is the conformal weight of the growth, C and C bar. So minus one and minus one. HL is the conformal dimension of this BL. H bar R is the conformal dimension of B bar R. And this I to the IKX, the same that I had here before, they have these conformal dimensions. Yeah? You see that they have different here because I get the, the sign and I use the parameter N. So if I make N equals minus one, I just get the same as the, the usual string. Okay, what happens here now? So for massless states, k square is zero. So I just get hl equals one, h bar equals one, and that will give me exactly what I was writing to you before. So for example, the graviton, the graviton by the operator will be just this one. There will be here some polarization. C, C bar, and I have here B, X, M. B bar x n e to the i x. Okay. So you see, conformal dimension one, conformal dimension one, it comes from this condition here when k square is zero. Okay. Now, what happens when uh, k square is different than zero? So let's say there is such such solution in in the system. So what I'll get at the end is this. So let's say I'm going up with k square, or maybe I have this written in the back. Okay. Yeah. So let's say I want a massive state. So I want k square negative. Yeah. If I start going with k square negative, in order for these two conditions to be satisfied, HL has to be increased. Yeah. So that's how I go to higher states usually in string theory. Like I have operators here with higher conformal weight. But because of this asymmetric twist here, H bar R has to go down. And there is no ingredient uh, that you can use to build a vertex operator. So these are the only things that you can use. There is no uh, there is no conformal operator, uh, primary operator with negative conformal weight except for the ghost. So this is how you see that there is only a finite spectrum. Because if you go to higher mass levels, one of them has to grow. This is allowed because you have all the ingredients, but the other one has to go down, and you don't have. And it turns out that. If if you go to 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 a massive solution, one of them is just k square equals four uh, n over alpha prime. So this basically will have h bar equals zero. So there will be just a one here. But then the 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 v l here is exactly the same vertex operator of the open stream. Okay? So you see there is a solution with massless states. And one massive level that corresponds to the n, n mass level of the open stream. And so, in fact, there is nothing special with the, the first massive level as soon as you recognize there is a parameter there uh, describing the, the twist. 
So here, these are the combinations that I wrote before. So when you're computing scattering amplitudes, this kind of object will appear, and this is what you get. And you see, when n equals minus one, you see it's exactly the one I wrote before. No, no uh, branch cuts. But for any n different than minus one, there are branch cuts. Yeah. And you see, this is a problem because, uh, well, because of what I'm going to say today. <laughs> so. If you use these things, you can compute three point amplitudes. It, it works as in usual string theory. You have a self between variance. You can fix position of the vertices. But for, for the four point case, this is the kind of uh, integration you have to solve. And see, this is highly ill defined, let's say, because of the branch curves. Right? For example, look at this. And, and, and bar, and and bar are integers, so they're fine. But you see here, I have z to the s. And I have here z bar to the minus s over n. So this thing has a lot of branch cuts. And so it's ill defined. I cannot really uh, get something useful out of it unless I, I give you a prescription. Uh, I have to give you an additional information to get some uh, information from, from this integral. Yeah? So this was this was the conjecture of the of the paper, this one. So this is my paper. Yeah? Basically, there is uh, a well, uh, let's say, a uh, systematic prescription to get uh, information from this integral. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is what I said. Sorry. So there are these branch cards. You need this additional prescription. But before going that, like, without trying to solve, you can okay, just compute a four-point amplitude without doing the integration. And then look uh, for some desirable property, like what do I expect to have there? I can extract gauge invariance or the copy of this BRT exact states. There will be some crossing symmetry and so on. The physical poles that have to match what my spectrum and so on. And, and there, is, there is, in fact, a, a very nice uh, solution for this. So look at this integration. So I am the integral. I propose this formula. So there will be some rational function here of the momentum times this overall factor, omega n. I call it Dresden factor. And you see, when n equals minus one, it goes exactly back to, to the Gidastor Shapiro amplitude. Eh? So what I have before here. Here. You see, if you if you look at that equation in this one, there's gamma of s and gamma of minus s, and this is exactly what you have here. For n equals minus one. Gamma of s and gamma of one. And then what happens when n equals one? They cancel, right? So everything here cancels and you get a nice few theory amplitude, and that's what the, this uh, first massive level was about. You could, you could compute uh, few theory scattering amplitudes and everything would match nicely, spin two and so on. But then if you have go to, to higher mass levels, you automatically have higher spins, so you can expect some complications in your, in your scattering amplitude, and this is what happens here. Okay. Uh, okay, one important factor here is that uh, there are no poles except the ones I want to have there. Okay. So you see here, uh, this, uh, this function uh, has no poles, okay. because whenever there is a pole here in the numerator, there will be a, a matching pole in the, the denominator, so it's finite and well defined. Yeah. So it's, it's a very nice, let's say, conjecture for this integral because it has the expected properties. <coughs> okay, so just some motivation like, why does that integral make sense? Yeah. So there is this uh, famous Kavai uh, Levantai paper from 1986 where they show that. Uh, uh, closed string amplitudes can be thought of as the pro product of two open string amplitudes. Yeah? So it's very intuitive because a closed string you can kind of imagine as two open strings. Yeah? It's uh, intuitive in this sense. And in fact, if you if you follow their prescription, this is what you get for for the string, except for this kernel. So this is this looks like an open string amplitude, and this looks like a closed string amplitude. This is for points. Uh, but then there is this kernel. Yeah. It's called KLT kernel. So basically, how to if you if you look at this integral from the from the complex uh, from the complex integration, you can do some contour deformation and so on. And basically, what this uh, kernel captures is just a 
the right uh, branch cards to, to give you the, the integration. So what I did was to just to modify it a bit. Yeah? You can kind of imagine the same procedure there, but introduce a different kernel. And this is the different kernel. See from n equals one, these things cancel and you get the, the kernel from the from KL3. So once you put everything together, this is the integration that you will get. So this is conjecture. It hasn't been, been proven yet. But in any case, it has all the this expected properties as I told you. Uh, in particular, you see here there's always this sign of pi s over sign of pi s over n. So whatever pole you can imagine here, it will appear in integer s. It will be cancelled by this this thing. Here. So whenever pi s is an integer, uh, whenever s is a uh, Sorry, whenever s is an integer, this, this thing will kill pole, and it will not kill only those where s is proportional to n. Yeah? For example, if s is equal to n, this is zero, but this, this is also an yeah? So the, the ratio is not, uh, is not zero. So this, this uh, prescription here, it effectively introduces in your amplitude something that kills all the poles except the ones you want. So this is why in these uh, four-point amplitudes where you would have all these uh, higher spin fields propagating in higher mass modes, because of this prescription, all of them are killed except for the ones you want. And so this is just an example, if, if you want, a uh, four-point gluon amplitude in string theory. Right? Uh, there is this prefactor, that is the one I introduced, but the, the amplitude itself is just a few theory amplitude. So this is a four-point gluon amplitude. So if you just take young mu's theory and compute a four-point amplitude, this is what you're going to get. This extra part comes from uh, what we call double trace contributions, for example. I have the gravit on there and I have these other massive poles. And you see that the pole structure ma matches exactly the, the physical structure of it. There are some mass, massless poles, this S, T, and U, but there are also the massive poles when S equals minus N. And everything else is killed by this, uh, this overall factor. If, if you want more details, there is this T here. It's given by this uh, equation. So it's always in terms of this moment, the K1, K2, K3, K4, and some polarizations here of the rules. Okay. So what, what is the view of this uh, overall Dresden factor? If you try to, to, to extract from this, this amplitude some kind of effective field theory distribution, there will be a, a neat field expansion in terms of alpha prime here. And remember that alpha prime is hidden inside of S, D, and U. And because of that, any amplitude you compute at four points will have an infinite number of k's yeah, in the expansion. So if you want uh, an effective field theory description there, you have the nice poles that you get. But even at four points, you have all these higher derivative operators. Yeah? And it is consistent with the, the higher spin literature. Uh, so you can ask about other nice properties, like in eternity, there are a lot of no bull theorems for, for this kind of amplitude. But I think um, some of them could be avoided because you still have this infinite number of derivatives. So in a way, you have no locality there that you see you could still have unitarity in these amplitudes, but it hasn't been proven yet. And so it's, it's what I'm writing. And these high derivatives, they might introduce these non trivial ingredients that kind of uh, Avoid these assumptions of the novel theorems. And uh, I think one of the interesting things of this of this result is that it has this uh, soft string-like behavior. It means that uh, in string theory, all these amplitudes for n equals one, they have a very nice uh, high energy behavior. They are finite, and and they have this kind of behavior here, this overall factor. And this, this model with this uh, asymmetric twist, it preserves the high energy behavior. Yeah? So it's something that has, has been expected to happen only in string theory, but even with a fine inspection, you can have it. And the only way to justify this is again to this uh, 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 infinite number of higher derivatives. 
So where, where are this higher derivatives coming from exactly? So okay. that I'm confused to that. So uh, remember that, uh, let's see here. Okay, this. So these are the four point amplitude in string theory. Yeah? So these are gamma functions, so they're not rational functions. And these are the kinematic variables. So if you want to compute a scattering amplitude that matches this, uh, this amplitude, you have to propose some vertex operators, a few theory. And then you compute it, and you see that, in fact, there are like higher and higher number of, of, of case. Because if you expand this around alpha prime equals zero, there'll be S, S square, S cube, and so on. And all these operators, they involve higher power of momentum. And the only way to get them is to have higher. Uh, okay. Okay. And so it has this nice high energy behavior. You see, for again, for n equals one, for n equals minus one, you get this to cancel. It's exactly the answer you get from, from string theory. And here, too, for n equals minus one, you have this uh, what we call a hard scattering limit. So you don't have to know this, but uh, just appreciate the fact that, uh, like, this uh, high energy behavior is, is not. Uh, in few theory amplitudes, they appear. They are very string theory like right? because they are stopped in knowing. Okay, so one thing that would happen here, for example, for n equals minus one, we we'll have your gamma of t over gamma of minus t, and this thing in, in the numerator will have both, because gamma of t like could have gamma of minus one, gamma of minus two, and all these things are divergent. So these are called uh, regular resonances, and they match the spectrum for you. But because here we have a finite spectrum, there shouldn't be any resonance there. And you see that for any n different than, than minus one, this is what you get. There are no resonance. And it's again consistent with the, the finite spectrum. Okay. So let me let me give you now a, a better idea of the motivation once you know these details. Things that let me show you. Let's say for, for the n equals one case. So this is the HST one. So there is a finite spectrum. And because of that, there's a few two there that you can you can build a Lagrangian for example. Right? So basically you can you can define a Lagrangian with uh, uh, spin two. So what we did with, with uh, some collaborators is that from this Lagrangian, so this is a few theory computation, you can kind of uh, shortcut the CFT computation that you get from string theory. Yeah? So what does it mean? I can compute string amplitudes and match them with a uh, few theory amplitudes. Yeah? So let's say QFT. Okay. If you have a finite Lagrangian, you can compute this. And you can translate this to, to string theory. Yeah? So you kind of shortcut the CFT computation, have all these OPEs and so on. And it's a very, very straightforward procedure. But we did this only for n equals one, that's only one massive level. The question is can we repeat this procedure for a higher end? Yeah? So basically, we can build a quantum field theory or, or just a field theory because we are working three level with higher spins, higher masses, but then can we shortcut? Again, to, to string theory. And this is a, an unprecedented result in string theory because we don't know we, we don't know much about massive things. It's very hard to compute and it's very hard to kind of systematically generalize anything we get. For instance, there is no, for example, there is an endpoint amplitude for massive states, but there's no such thing for massive states. Right? We don't know much about massive states. And this is the basic the, the strategy that I would like to, to propose with this model. And to, to emulate this n equals one uh, result that we obtain, but to to higher ends and higher speed. And so this is why this model is interesting because we're kind of uh, using this interplay between field theory and string theory to learn something effective about string theory with massive states. Uh, okay, this is this is the first motivation which I which I would like to pursue. But then you can look at this model as a, like a, 
a working theory for higher spins. There are a lot of people interested in higher spin theories with affected models. So you can try to look at them and see if you if you learn anything about the the higher spin field theory from, from this construction. Uh, okay, another thing is that uh, these uh, CHY amplitudes that they come from the tensionless limit of n equals one, they are very important in the theory of scattering amplitudes. They give you very generic tools to, to explore and compute, effectively compute amplitudes. But then, uh, can we do the same for, for this model with uh, n greater than one? Turns out that the, the tensionless limit in this model is, is not that straightforward as the result <laughs> one case. But if you get something, you get like a, a very CHY like formulation of hyper speed. Yeah? So this would be very desirable for, for people in scattering amplitudes because they could have a very uh, systematic framework for computing uh, uh, field theory amplitudes in higher speed. And one of the other things that you can look at this model is n goes to infinity. Yeah? So when, go, when n goes to infinity in this OP, basically you kill this uh, anti-holomorphic part. <laughs> so you're, you're left with this uh, holomorphic part that looks a lot like uh, an open string. So naively, if you take the, the n to infinity limit, you get uh, an enhanced spectrum because you're going back to the open string. So these are two limits to, to look for. If you want to compute loops, I mentioned this very briefly that uh, you, have, you, have, you probably break modular invariance in the usual in the usual sense. When you when you do this twist from minus one to <laughs> plus one over n, you break modular invariance in string theory, at least conventional uh, conventional modular invariance. There could be some non-conventional realization, but this is uh, just speculation. Uh, okay, a first principle derivation of this model would be interesting because at least we could understand a bit more why this singling out of the higher higher massive modes or higher higher spins, how they come about in string theory, and maybe there could be a more systematic way of extracting this information from them. And yeah, and hopefully at the end we'll learn more about this role of mass in string theory. So that's it. Do you have any questions, remarks, please? I have a question. Um, um, can we go back? I mean, my question is on the on VRP between X and itself. I still I didn't get exactly where you derive this from. Independently, I mean, even if there is an N or, or with or without N, mm -hmm. and in particular, I, mean, I would like to to see if you derive this from 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 a, a partition function from Z or no, you, you can look at you can look at the polyacrylic action in the first order formulation. Yeah? Okay. So if you look there in the polar convection, the first order combination, there's a P, there's an X, there's some gauge choice that you can make. And then you can identify this gauge choice as the singular one that I mentioned. But uh, do you want the equations or do you want the intuition again? Equation. I mean, equation. No, so equations, you can look at one of my papers. I can okay. show you that. Okay. And then uh, you could have put anything there instead of M. It, this n could have been a, a, a real number. Yes. If, if you put it by hand, it can be anything. Yep. So, is there any meaning if you put n or uh, okay, pi so, or what yeah. is the spectrum of okay, pi so or mean? First of all, if n is, uh, is uh, not an integer, there is no solution to this equation. Basically, because h bar has to be an integer. Ah, okay, sure, sure. Yeah. So, okay, this is where you see that then must be a uh, uh, natural loop. Okay. But uh, I can tell about two weeks after my paper, uh, Siegel published a paper with a lambda here. <laughs> Instead of ah. they put a lambda. Okay. They didn't analyze the, the same things I did, but they, they just tried to motivate this as, as a way to, to look at string theory from kind of a particle description, let's say. So it's a paper 
2109 something. Uh, Lambda was on the right hand side. Lambda was used at a bit. Ah, okay. So it was actually a. They, they, they didn't know about my papers. Okay. But uh, I can say that my paper is nicer. <laughs> <laughs> it has uh, like much, much better structure and motivation in the sense that I can use this to, have, to study higher things and, and mass. But in their case, this lambda was. Was an integer or a lambda was a, a, a real a complex parameter. Ah, in the complex. Yeah. Okay. So the it problem. So they didn't have this interpretation in terms of CFT and uh, weights. The, so, no, the H bar is not. H not integer anymore. H bar is not integer. H bar. Yeah. Uh, in their case. No, they don't. They, this thing, they don't have this factor, and the okay. amplitude okay. they proposed. So, uh, as I said, the amplitude that I proposed here, like the the basically the the conjecture of this integral, it has all these functions. They don't have it, yeah. So they have a they have a kind of a sum of open string amplitudes that that have a, like a different poles. So they don't have this uh, nice match in the spectrum. They have something that's a bit uh, ugly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And this physical state condition comes from the importance of the PRC. So the PRC charge is important, important, but uh, the physical state they have to be inflated by it, and that's where these equations come from. Okay. You just basically annihilate this operator with the PRC charge, and these are the conditions you create. Okay. This is one string theory, n equals minus one theory are very similar, and you get the graviton vertex operator and so on. And all the other states, but uh, because of the twist, we have this truncation. This part. Okay. Uh, in you were you were saying that the uh, the broken modular invariants, and uh, you say non-conventional realization. What do you mean by so? So modular invariance in in string theory it comes from this partition function. It's like a little trace of the of the physical spectrum you have in your tube. Yeah? This is how you define the, the partition function. It's like a trace of the operators. Exactly. Maybe there could be a twisted trace. Yeah? It's like, like instead of the trace of being a diagonal, it could be a trace of a kind of a how do you call it? skewed diagonal. Okay. Yeah? So there could be a real, uh, I'm saying, is there a conjecture? Right? No, I'm not, it's just speculation, because I haven't thought about it. Right? If there is modular invariance, it has to be something non conventional because in the, in the traditional sense, it's not there. It's very easy to see it's not there. Okay. Eva has a question. I don't know how to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi, Renan, very nice talk. This is Ivo. You mentioned that you had infinitely many derivatives, but yet you seem to be able to construct a, a quantum field tree to reproduce this amplitude. So that would be the goal, right? We, we don't have a, a, an effective field tree formulation of it. But if there is, it will have to have this uh, high infinite character. I see. All right. Thank you. So let me just mention briefly this. Uh, this structure for omega n is quite universal. So you see, for for a given n, omega n has has a very uh, it's a, it's a given structure. This works for for any four point amplitude for a given master. Yeah. So maybe because of this kind of uh, general behavior, we'll be able to 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 propose a few theory description at least uh, more systematically because you have this kind of rich structure for for omega. But there, as I said, we haven't done this yet. Is there any other question? No. In the case, uh, I'll go for another uh, round of applause. Sure. Sure. Yeah.